Thank you, Amy. Thanks for your sponsorship. That's all we have time for. We'll see you next year. <laughs> You know, I'm really glad you're here today. We have a lot to talk about. There's going to be time for questions. Uh, we were talking earlier. We think it's kind of funny we're on the technology stage because when our career started, there was no technology. Uh, the business is all about change. Uh, we've got a lot of lessons to tell you about today. If you look around the show floor, you know, 30, 40% of the products on this floor didn't even exist just a few years ago. So we have a lot of catching up to do. Um, we're going to start off by talking about that change. And what I want to ask the panel is, if you were starting out now, what would you do differently than you did back in the day when you did start? Why don't you take that, Skeeter? Well, I think the first thing I'd do is probably start out with a little bit more money and possibly have a better plan. When we opened up, we didn't even know how to cook a brisket. And uh, we didn't even have a menu. We went down to the grocery store. and. Uh, got a menu and colored it, the big cheap tablet. So I think, uh, you know, I, to do something different, I think that, you know, you got to have a better plan. Today, uh, you, have to, you have to have enough capital to, to go beyond opening up the store. So I think uh, we were lucky there was only 600 restaurants in Austin, Texas when we opened. There's 8,000 now. So you got to be a lot smarter than you used to be. Yeah. So capital is important. Russell. You know, um, not saying, well, first of all, it should say, uh, every day I'm trying to survive, right? This, this industry has changed so much over the last 15, 20 years. But I, I guess, you know, the, the saying, ignorance is bliss. When, uh, when I was opening up in 93, I'm glad there wasn't Instagram or all the social, me the social media platforms because I didn't have anything to compare it against, to compare myself against. And so when we launched in 93, we were trying to survive, taking over a building that had been four failed restaurant concepts doing only 580 bucks the first day. But our goal then and still today is to serve the absolute best product we can at the absolute best value that we can. And the consumer is very knowledgeable. They, they know every, every segment, whether it's fast food, quick casual, casual, fine dining, everyone knows the price point that's associated with each segment. So you can't pull the wool over the consumer's eyes. They're very, very smart. So what you're trying to do is obviously develop standards, systems, and, and try to be as consistent as you can in whatever you do. So, uh, but as far as uh, what I've learned, you know, every day you're learning, and every day, you, again, you're trying to survive. Well, I think it, if, if you look back the, the way that um, I was fortunate enough to start with the very first Chili's and Larry Levine, uh, the basics that I see successful restaurant chains and entrepreneurs starting are the basics that we had back then. And then I think as you involve, and I know we'll probably get to the future here in a minute on how you change and how do you grow, but uh, when we started at Chili's, I was one of the very first managers, and I got to learn with a true entrepreneur that there was no frozen food in the restaurant. Everything was made from scratch. He set everything up that we could have uh, very good contact with the customer. So the basic principles of a successful restaurant uh, are there at the very beginning. And I think as we grow, we lose a bit of that, and we can talk about that earlier. But I think starting out, to me, if I started over again, I would learn from the entrepreneurs that I worked with, Norman Brinker and Larry Levine, that the basics are food quality, customer service, and everything, the basics have to be there. And, and then as time changed, it's, it would work. Because it, there's totally different. When Larry started Chili's, he started with $90,000. I think a Chili's or a fast casual restaurant now is two and a half to three million to even look at it, you know, so. Uh, but the basics are the basics. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think the other thing we know now is that culture is, is paramount to our success. We didn't talk about it so much in the old days. We had, maybe we had a culture, but we now know that our culture markets to our guests and our culture also markets to our employees, which is something that we're all learning to do better. Uh, and uniqueness. With the market so saturated, what did you say, Skeeter? How many restaurants were there in Austin when you started? About, about 600. 600, now we're at 8,000. Uh, uniqueness becomes just critical. You've got to stand out. You can't just have what the next guy has. Um, and success, you know, there's a whole other trade show about success. There's seminars about success. There's books to read. There's podcasts you can download. Success is a whole other topic for our industry and every other industry. So what I want to do is take this moment to ask the panel, uh, what do they feel like is behind their success? Not the obvious things. 
obviously great food, great branding, great people, but their personal success, what has made them personally successful that may not be evident from an outsider? Creed, you want to take that one? Uh, I think a lot of it has to do with the traits. I think you have um, as an entrepreneur, as a, as, as a person, I think one of the traits that I had that made me successful is my loyalty uh, to a concept, to a brand, to a person. And I think my mother used to always tell me, you know, uh, if it don't succeed, try again. And if you don't succeed, keep trying and keep trying. And my dad said, you know, after the third or fourth time, if you don't succeed, you might as well quit. No sense making an ass out of yourself. Uh, I didn't get the last part. I just stuck to it and stuck to it. The early days of Chili's, and these guys will know when they first started, it was rough. I mean, we didn't open a lot of restaurants. Uh, Dallas was successful. Then we went to California, and we almost lost it there. Uh, we had to change our concept and whatever, but we just stuck to it and had really determination uh, to not give up. And I think that's one of the traits in the restaurant industry. Once you have your capital and you have your brand, it's very easy to get discouraged. Uh, you can open a restaurant, somebody comes in, I don't like your food. You gotta listen, but you gotta realize, that that's, is that the squeaky wheel or is that really our plan? Uh, so I think one of the, the traits I have is just the loyalty and determination just to not to give up. You know, I think um, a philosophy is obviously very, very important if you're going to succeed in business. Uh, there is a, a, a Japanese uh, word called kaizen, which basically means continual improvement, the philosophy of getting better each and every day. And what people wouldn't, what a lot of our guests and, and, and people who visit our stores would not realize is how much time and money and effort we spend in just maintaining our facilities, even in areas that they don't even see, whether it's going in the dumpster area and, and installing a brand new mop sink with nice tile. And uh, I think that a standard, a philosophy has to go from the back door to the front door and vice versa. You can't uh, you know, build this facade up front and not take care of the back of the house. The back of the house, which we call the heart of the house, is very important. But um, you know, um, years ago we had a, um, a restaurant concept that fell, uh, or fell forward if you will. and. What I took away from that experience was um, uh, when we started developing a new concept was, you know what, if I won't, if I won't eat it myself, I won't serve it. So it's, it's a philosophy I've incorporated, and it's, it's done us very well. I mean, every time we look at an ingredient or we're making an ingredient change, it's always an upgrade, never a downgrade. We don't buy on price. We buy on quality first, and we'll make the numbers work eventually. But I think it's very important to, uh, to have that type of philosophy. Kaizen. I got it. So um, I'm, I'm a pr pretty simple approach, you know. I mean, I've been uh, making potato salad for 43 years. So most important to me is our is our staff. Uh, our management team. We have an average management tenure of 39 years, and I've only hired one manager outside the company, which was 17 years ago. So they're really the heartbeat of our business. I mean, we we do everything from scratch. It takes 18 hours to cook a brisket. I mean, there's gotta be a lot of love that goes into that business. And every one of them has worked from the bottom up. And you know, the bottom line for me is if you don't listen to your employees, they, they know more than you know. Their, their boots are on the ground. And so if we did things the same way I did them 43 years ago, we'd probably be out of business. So we listen to our staff, we're willing to change. Change is so important in this business. And so uh, that's, that's, that's really the heartbeat of our business. Thanks, and uh, you know everyone finds their strength and their success in a very personal way. And you just heard three different things that came top of mind. So I would encourage you and your own businesses to reflect on where your greatest success is gonna come and how you can adapt some of those behaviors. Uh, and you know, out there as a restaurateur, you're always getting advice. And I say that as somebody who's <coughs> been a lifetime advising re restaurateurs. You're getting a ton of advice. You're getting it from your friends. You're getting it from your family. You're getting it from your guests. You're getting it from your peers. Uh, and you've got to learn how to sift through advice that is the things that you need to move forward and the things that are not right to you. So I want to take this minute uh, to ask the panel what the worst piece of advice anybody has ever given you about your restaurants. That's number one. And number two, did you take it? Who wants to go first on that one? Uh, I'll, I'll go first. Okay, Skeeter, go for it. Uh, the, well, I've gotten a lot of bad advice, okay? And so, uh, but location was probably one of the worst 
advice that I ever had. What is an A location for that group may not be an A location for me. And so we built a restaurant down on Westheimer, A location. Everybody came, said, well, the it's just like the county line, but something just wasn't the same. And what wasn't the same was the ambience and the atmosphere, being on a lake, being on a hill, being in a unique place next to the mountains, that's where all our locations are. So we listened and we took some bad advice and we changed the way we do things. So that was advice about site selection? Yes. That's how you learned your site criteria? Yes. The hard way? Yes. All right. Russell? Actually, my, the very first advice I ever got was not to open. Um, I, was, I was told I was crazy stupid and I was going to fail, and that was just my family telling me this. Uh, so if I was getting advice, I, mean, I, I try to listen to everything someone says, uh, as minute as it may sound, because there's always something in that message. But I, I like to uh, really try to focus and pay attention to what our guests experience at every level, whether it's, uh, whether it's uh, the, the music, the lighting, uh, just the flow of the restaurant, where the bottlenecks are, the congestion, um, everything. Uh, you know, and I like to go in and sit in different areas of the restaurant just to see what they see when they're sitting down. So it's really about them, and I just try to pay attention to anything they see, basically. Well, I think this session's too short to, to <laughs> list the bad advice that I've, that I've received and executed on. But uh, I, think the, I think one of them is, is concept development and menu development, because everybody, this is what's so great about this industry. And everybody wants to have their own restaurant. Everybody wants to be a part of it, because there's so many facets of it that is just that's really fun to be in. And that's why we're all here for all these years. But, a great example is when we uh, purchased the Elite Cafe in uh, late 1999, my wife and I, and we bought the area there to put a Rudy's, and we bought the Elite Cafe from David Tinsley, who had the health camp, and he's the founder of Tinsley's Fried Chicken. David told me, Waco needs something high-end, upscale. We don't have any really nice restaurants in Waco. So I said, okay. Didn't really get up there in 30,000 feet and research and think about it. I just took his his opinion. So we brought in the chefs from our gumbos location out of, out of Austin and we did high-end food and we did all this little chefy quirky stuff, made the place kind of contemporary. We were so proud of it, so great. We opened the door. The first person that walked in is a lady, a local, in a jogging suit and said, where's the biscuits? And we thought, oh my God, we really <laughs> messed up. And now you look at it, we, we changed it, we went back and forth and from that advice and now Joanne and Chip purchased the Elite uh, last year, and they did uh, Magnolia Table. And what they do, they went back to the diner, kind of the roadside deal, of course, with their name. Anything they do is success, and they've done a fantastic job. But I, I think, to me, just concept development, menu development is, is some of the advice that you have to sit back and raise up above it and do a lot of research before you take bad advice and not do, get too emotional about it. That's my, my problem. Well, there's, there's no restaurateur in this room that hasn't made a mistake. And it's the process of learning from that. And as Skeeter said earlier, having the capital to uh, withstand your mistakes and your learning. Uh, and I think it's, it's super important to have confidence in what you're doing, but also listen and factor in who you're listening to. Um, and what Russell's family said, don't do it. We saw what one piece of advice could do to a restaurant that had to be tweaked later. Uh, you're going to have to filter through that advice because we're in the public eye. We're out there. Everybody can see us, and we get a lot of input. Um, and, in, you know, in terms of improving your restaurants and your restaurant company, everything comes back to the people and the, the management that make your restaurants go every day. You not only have you got to be great at culinary and great at service and great at marketing and great at site selection, but you've got to be a great leader. And that's a whole other piece of what you do in your restaurants. It's how you lead. And what I want to ask the panel for is their greatest leadership lesson and how they put it to work every day. Because without leadership and without management, all the greatest talent and operational capability in the world isn't going to go anywhere. Creed, let me give you that one. Well, like I said earlier, I had the opportunity to work with some really great leaders from Larry Levine to Norman Brinker to Phil Romano and what have you. And, and Norman Brinker always had a list of 12 leadership characteristics that we all kind of know, you know, try hard, focus, and, and, and what have you. But 
I had, Norman and I were had the opportunity to, to travel together a lot, and it was late at night in California. I asked him, I said, okay, I, I read your book. I know all the rules. What leadership trait is the most important? And he said, timing. And if you think about that and you sit back a little bit, that's an important trait that a lot of people have to de develop and learn. Timing when to uh, evaluate an employee, time to when to recognize something, time to when to change the menu, timing when to change the brand, to purchase a concept, to close a store, which kills us all, but every now and then you gotta say, it's not working. And so I think timing in our business is really important, but it takes a lot of experience to be able to recognize that trait and that's why I know these guys up here will say, we are always learning. We have not figured it out yet. And we're, we're you know, it's, it's just part of education. Um, yeah, leadership, um, at the end of the day, it's about inspiring others to improve and to get better. Um, we're doing something in a few weeks uh, that I don't think any, anyone's ever done. So my first job was a dishwasher. <clears throat> I kind of understand what a dishwasher goes through. And you know, if they were to walk out during a shift, the restaurant comes to a grinding halt. In a couple of weeks, uh, we're we're um, we're hosting or having uh, an event called Dishwasher Appreciation Week at our company, and we're going to be appreciating over over 85 dishwashers throughout our company, and uh, they're going to be getting a goodie bag with uh, at least $100 in cash plus a lot of other stuff, and uh, we're going to recognize them and show show them how much we appreciate them. But it goes far. Uh, Far and beyond that, you know, it, when, when your other team members, employees see that, they, 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 they really understand you care, and, and you have to care and, and genuinely care for, for you to be a good leader and to inspire others to be better at what they do. Well, uh, I was lucky. Bruce Walcott was the uh, founder of the county line, him and several people, but he, uh, he was a leader that I learned from that the deal was is that you lead by example you get out there and you get your hands dirty with the rest of the people. And, uh, and people look, we looked up to him. But the other thing that was really important with Bruce is, is he always gave you the autonomy to, to make a decision, to make a mistake, to learn something from that mistake. And he never ever got upset with you or anything. He just wanted to make sure that you learned from what you did. If it was good, what can, how can you do it better? If it wasn't right, what are we going to do to change that? And so that's what our philosophy is at County Line. Obviously, with a tenure of uh, employees for 30 years, I mean, these guys are the heartbeat of the business. And so uh, that's, that's leadership, and, and they all take on the same leadership role the same way. Thanks, guys. You know, you have to reflect on that. You're busy with your restaurants. You're operating. Uh, you've got a lot going on, but you have to think about how you're leading simultaneously. And when you grow your company, there's not a lot of time for that. So leadership often makes or breaks any group because that's what makes things happen. So I would really encourage those of you who are starting out or growing to really, really hone that piece uh, because it's not gonna get any simpler as we go forward. And I wanna talk about the future a little bit. I wanna spend a little extra time because we're all here together. We're all helping each other become successful and everybody wants to know what's coming next. So the next thing I wanna ask the panel is Let's go out five years or 10 years in the industry. You know, we're all making investment and real estate decisions right now uh, to build restaurants that we hope will be open for 10, 20 years. Uh, where are we going? What's coming up next? How do you, uh, three of you, evaluate deals? And what would you tell these people in the audience about what to expect in the next generation of the industry? Who wants to take that one first? Well, Skater? I can tell you right now, in 10 years, I'll be 73, okay? And I still need a job. So, but, but what I see in our industry is, you know, technology, technology is, is, is helping you run your business better. I think that that's going to get even better. I think your footprint of your restaurants, in my opinion, is going to get smaller. Uh, you know, you're going to see less table service. I think you're going to, so people get their menu prices down. You're going to see smaller portions. I think, I think you're going to see a lot of that. Delivery is huge in our business. Uh, so I, I, I just think there's going to be a lot of change and timing is, it's like, like Creed said, it's everything. When, when, do, you, when do you change? When do you make the, make the leap to the next thing? Russell? Basically everything Skeeter just said, but also, you know, quality of life is still a, a, big, uh, a big point in our, in our, in our industry. Uh, years, I grew up 
when managers work six days a week. That's changed. It's, it's now five days a week. And I completely understand why. And, uh, of course, benefits are, are eating away at, uh, at, at the cost of, of, of operating a restaurant as well as the, the cost of the, uh, the employee. So, um, uh, you know, it, social media, I never thought we would have a full-time social media person monitoring social media 24-7. But uh, it has changed our industry tremendously, and we have to respond to it. The last thing you want something to do is go viral that could literally destroy your company. And it's happening every day. There's always someone doing something somewhere, and uh, everyone has a device that can, can bring it to light. So you have to be very careful. Um, you know, move slowly um, and think on your feet, obviously. But you know, if you treat your, your staff and team members the way they should be treated, the way you'd want to be treated, um, it will solve a lot of problems potential problems that could, could destroy your company. And uh, uh, so anyway, yeah. Well, I think the future is going to always look back that this business is so basic because all we're really doing is taking some food that from our wonderful vendors out here, putting a creative spin on it, nice little brand, and reselling it. I think sometimes we get so wrapped up in, in the future that us as entrepreneurs can lose focus. So I think the, the basics of the restaurant industry in the future is gonna remain the same. What doesn't remain the same is what Russell talked about is the ever-changing employee and what they think about. Technology is unbelievable because if you look at how many, when we, when we started Chili's and Skibble would know this, we had basically an NCR 250 and it did the product mix and that's it. Uh, now, I can pull up on my phone and tell you labor costs per hour, per person, what have you, we all into that. But I think it's important that the future technology and the sophistication of our industry doesn't take away from the fundamentals that we all have to have. And I've seen a lot of operators get so wrapped up in that. And, uh, and I've seen all these cycles. I've seen home offices where the GNA gets really high because all these people in there and training department and technology and what have you, they're doing all these things to make our business easier and simpler and to create ways to combat, to be competitive in the future, but they're really not having anything to do with the day-to-day -day thing of going around to the table and thank you so much for being here, going up to the dishwasher and thank you for being here and having that relationship with your people. So I, I think we all know where the future is going, but we gotta pay attention, we gotta watch movies, we gotta read books, we gotta listen to the news, we gotta talk to our employees, what they're thinking but we can't lose the fact of the basics. And that's, I always look at the future as, a, as excited that it's gonna be there, but don't forget where we, where we came from, the fundamentals of our industry. And that's why I love the history of concepts, you know, how they got started. I think that's very true. You've always gotta maintain the fundamentals and we've got some crazy new changes coming at us, technology, you're starting to see it here. We've had for the, uh, the smaller restaurant tour, the medium sized restaurant tour has had technology in different pieces. Where in the next few years, it's all gonna converge into one platform. There's some products on the floor here this year that are starting to go in that direction. Uh, that's an important, you know, we were talking earlier about delivery. Your restaurants are gonna be smaller because more of your food is gonna be consumed outside of your restaurants. Now, meanwhile, retail, as we know it is going away, and real estate is relying on us more and more to fill up their shopping centers. So how, how is that going to work out? We're going to see some changes on that in terms of the way real estate is structured because of that. There'll be restaurants with double lines, one line for delivery, one line for the dining room so you can get the food out fast enough. We have a lot of changes coming at us in the coming years. And I also think that you're going to make a choice about going in one of two directions. You're either going to be high touch, high service, or you're going to be low touch, and you're going to communicate to your guests through a screen and we're starting to see that now. Our guests are getting used to ordering off of screens, and that does not always equal hospitality. And as Freed said, it's always gonna be a hospitality business. So these are some of the challenges <coughs> that we're facing. You gotta choose which one you are. Um, I wanna take a little side trip for a second and talk about the Texas Restaurant Association. All of us up here have been involved in different boards, different positions on TRA and our local chapters. We have three Hall of Honor, uh, people up here with us today, the highest award you can get for recognition in the industry. You got two? <laughs> You're, <I'm> sorry, dude. <laughs> I should be better prepared. Next year. Okay. Uh, 
I said a lot of you come here to you know TRA because you come to the show, or maybe you go to some meetings in your local chapter. But I want to show you to share with the audience how industry involvement has helped your businesses, because that's a real important part of TRA and NRA behind the scenes. Who wants to take that one first? Russell. Uh, one of my passions is politics. Um, I'm a big believer in digging your well before you're thirsty. And uh, so I've, I've been involved with the TRA PAC for a number of years and have contributed. And I'm proud to say that I'm the number one contributor to PAC at $10,000 level per year. And I'll say that only because if you are a restaurateur, and I said this the other night at the, at the gala, if you are a restaurateur and you do not contribute to PAC, I want to say this as nicely as possible, but you ought to be ashamed of yourself because PAC has saved you thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, and especially in, in the more recent uh, change that we did with the liquor tax, if you have a mixed beverage permit uh, and you do just any amount of sales in alcohol, we're saving you thousands of dollars. And all we're asking for is a thousand dollars a year consistently, not just give it one time and forget about it, but put it on your calendar. Every year you send a thousand dollars to PAC because we need the money. There's a lot of stuff coming down uh, in the next, next legislature that, I can, and that will affect your labor, I can guarantee you. So we're gonna be fighting that and it takes money to fight and win. So uh, PAC has been uh, near and dear to my heart and of course the Education Foundation as well. Thanks to Carmelo Morrow for that. He's been a, a, a huge leader in that endeavor. But Go ahead, Greg. Uh, as, as I grew in the restaurant industry, when you're a small little operator, you use a TRA if you're a member. As you get really big, we created these huge home offices, and we started doing everything ourselves. We built our own training department, our own training videos, and what have you, and all that is there in the TRA. And over the course of the years, once I left Brinker and Lynn and I have our own little company, we use TRA a lot. The answers to most of your problems are in the Texas Restaurant Association or the National Restaurant Association. So don't forget that. Use it as an association to really help you. I mean, in the political side, I, I wear Richie out, and I call him and go, oh my God, what about this and that and the other? And, and it's, it's just really important. But I think um, just the tools they have has helped us so much uh, because it's a difficult, a difficult, very complex industry that we live in so much more than when these, uh, you're a pretty young guy. But yeah, he's a, he's a rookie. It's going to be called the antique show. Skeeter and I are but uh, it was so simple back then. But now you have all these uh, issues that are so important. I don't want to downsize any of them. But uh, the TRA has really helped us uh, be able to combat most of that. So use your membership, get online, research, and try to solve those issues. And then, of course, the PAC is, we're, we're right there with you. It's so important. Yeah, and we've, uh, we've been uh, given to the PAC for over 20 years. and. Uh, I'm a firm believer if you're not at the table, then you're going to be on the menu for sure. And so uh, I know, but as far as the TRA goes, I mean, I got to tell you, you know, here we're talking about 40 plus years of being in business and you've got an opportunity to sit down with three, 400 people that are in your same business. They've taken bad advice and they can give you better advice. You just can't beat being able to, to, to communicate with these folks and ch exchange ideas and stay current. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible. It's a wealth of knowledge. Plus, what's really nice for me, now I live in, in, the, I live in Austin, the San Francisco of Texas, and so we got a lot of stuff going on there. And so to be able to reach out to Richie and call Richie and say, you know, Sid Miller and I don't get along very well, okay? And, and so the Houston Chronicle's calling me and saying, hey, we want to do an article about how you feel about Sid Miller. And I go, well, that's, not, that's, a, that's a horrible idea. But at the same time, I don't want to not talk to the press. So I call Richie and made him do it. So, uh, so that's, that's, that's very, that's, 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 that was very helpful. But honestly, to be, to be able to associate with so many great people that are in our industry, you just can't, you can't beat it. And I think that's super important. Yeah, I think that a lot of people don't know uh, the thing about restaurateurs in the restaurant association, especially the local chapters. Uh, competitors will help each other out. People that with restaurants across the street from each other in the same segment will go to a local restaurant association chapter meeting and help each other out. And if you're not taking advantage of that, you really ought to. Uh, and let me add one thing to what you already heard. I'm on the 
board of the Texas Restaurant Association Education Foundation. We have 25,000 high school students around the state in our culinary and management programs, Texas Pro Start. It is the largest high school culinary program in the nation. And if you are not involved with the high school kids in your community, you're missing out on a tremendous opportunity, not only to inspire some people, but to bring some people to a work in two restaurants in the coming years. So I think TRA offers you a lot of opportunity and uh, no better time to talk about it than the one time a year we all get together. Uh, before we break up, we've got some time for some questions. I know you have them. I know nobody ever wants to ask the first question. Uh, but if there's a brave soul out there that has a question you'd like us to talk about, uh, we're ready. Who's, who wants to uh, chime in? Anybody? I know it's on, the, it's on the top of mind. Okay, let me come out there. Yes. Uh, when it comes to site selection, how do you, do you get a leg up on your competition? When it comes to site selection, Adrian's question is, how do you get a competitive advantage when you are selecting your sites? It's something we think about every day. Russell. Well, two of the most important components in site selection is accessibility and visibility. Uh, accessibility. So um, that's very important. But, uh, you know, one thing I've discovered as, as we've grown is you, you can't underestimate the value of uh, the synergy of being around other developments and other brands because you don't want to be a lone location out in the middle of nowhere and trying to draw because it's just it's getting more and more difficult to do that. So uh, we started off that way, but it's probably not the way we're going to continue because of the advantages you get with being around other restaurants. Yeah, and, and my advice is, is don't build a county line next to a Rudy's over here at Creed Space. And so, uh, but one of, the, one of the important things for us is when we look for a site, A, is it's got to be in a beautiful place like the county line is, but parking, parking is an issue. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's a huge issue. And a lot of times people will build a restaurant, they don't have enough parking, and it just kills their business. So simple, simple thing is to just check that out. Just a real brief concept, uh, comment. It's really tough for us entrepreneurs and restaurateurs these days because the economy is getting better, and you spend some time driving around and you think about it. And you go, "Oh, I really like that site," and then you call a realtor and what have you. Go, "Yeah, yeah," and all of a sudden, two days later, it's taken. A new development will come up, and you go, "Oh, that's a good retail center. All the spaces are already all leased." So a network is really important. Uh, I'm not saying go to Vegas and go to IC. I uh, conference, the uh, real estate conference, but you got to have, once you determine that you're going to look for sites, you've got to build your little war chest and, and get some help and some people to help you look for it, because what we try to do is get creative, and you go to an old gas station or something, and walk in there, there's a guy sitting there behind the counter smoking a cigar, and, how you doing? You, you about ready to retire? He goes, well, I'm kind of thinking about it, and or well, you want to sell this location, or what are you thinking? He goes, well, you know, I never even thought about it, but I, I might consider something a year or so. So you got to be creative nowadays because all these developments are moving quick, and, and we found that too. We get excited about a location, and it's taken. And uh, so that's my two cents. And as I, as I said earlier, we're at the end of a, of a curve where it's a landlord's market. I believe that's going to switch maybe in about five to seven years, but the next five to seven years are going to be tough. And the reason it's going to switch is retail's going away, going to be more and more space and there's going to be more and more opportunities for us and there's going to be more and more building but the next five to seven years is very very challenging for space we know question down here would you mind speaking to the issue of sort of the micro restaurants that are like the one concept like the small grilled cheese store or avocado store that are starting to pop up and what are you seeing the future for those are okay single item restaurants what do you guys see Go ahead, Creed. Single item restaurants. I'll take it. Uh, single item restaurants uh, are very niche, as you well know. Uh, we just launched a new burger concept called Burger Libre, and we're developing the menu. And um, uh, yeah, unless you have a tremendous amount of foot traffic, uh, niche, niche items are, are, are very dangerous, to say the least. Uh, we had a, a tenant in one of our strip centers open up 
a coffee and um, cupcake store, and they didn't make it. They just didn't make it. Um, but I don't know where else I was going with that, but I'll, so I'll, let, I'll let him take it. Uh, it, it. That's a great question because we had a, a friend of ours came up years ago, and he goes, I want a, a grilled cheese. I'm going to do a grilled cheese concept. I'm going to have four or five grilled cheese. And we're scratching our head going, how is this going to work? And he's looking for money. He said, I'm starting a container first. And lo and behold, we said, no, we don't want to get involved. He's, and he's done fantastic. But I will say this, at the very, you know, when we had the first chilies, we had four hamburgers. We had, you remember, we had French fries, margaritas, very, very limited. And I call it corporate creep. Somebody will come in and go, oh, I love your avocado. Can you make an avocado quesadilla? And then you make an avocado quesadilla. Somebody, can you make a chicken avocado quesadilla? This thing, you know, you got a buffet in there. Or, <laughs> and you it totally lose focus on what your brand is. So I think single item or category, I'll call it, is important because you get your basics down and then you can expand from there, from there as long as you don't get too whacked out. And if you look at the... Look, Brinker International, we did it when I was there. We grew way too fast and expanded menus way too fast uh, because we were listening to the squeaky wheel. Somebody come in and go, I want this on the menu. I know this this guy and his concepts, they have discipline. You know, it's, they do great things at what they continue to do. The same with with, with uh, County Line. So it, it's a tough one, but it's a, I think it's a good start, but you got to build that traffic and expand the items as they go, as the people need it. Skater. I, my advice is is that uh, I'd make sure that single item is super, super good, okay? <laughs> don't, don't take the advice just because you have a dinner party at 20 and everybody thought that was good, that maybe that's the way to go, you know, so make sure it's super good. And the challenge on single item concepts is the longevity because at the beginning, you've got the item. And five, seven, ten years down the line, everyone's put it on their menu and you lose your distinctiveness. So that's something to really think about. But it's a great way to start a trend. Other questions? Jason. Hi there. Um, the marketing game has changed dramatically since you guys got your start. With the onset of the internet, how has that changed your approach? Skater. Well, we, uh, you know, people TiVo, so they don't watch TV. You don't see the advertisements. They're listening to Pandora on the radio, so hear any of that. So social media has just been the real key for us. Like, like uh, uh, they said earlier, you know, we have a social media manager in each one of our locations because they're all unique. So uh, social media has been a big part of our business. We meet once a month with all our social media managers. We talk about how things are changing. There's a million different things you can do with social media. But pick, pick a few things that work really well for you and get better at that. Russell. We've, um, we try to keep our marketing uh, very simple. It's, it's mostly uh, social media. But uh, I think what's important is that, that operators really spend the time and effort uh, internal marketing with your, with your existing base. The biggest fans you'll ever have are all the people that are currently dining with you. And they can help spread the word. So engage them as much as you can. But, um, but also just um, keep training, uh, keep improving, keep just keep your ears low to the ground and, and focus there because you can spend all this money on external, but a lot of times if they, if they come in and they don't come back, what good did it really do? So it's really about spending the time inside your, inside your four walls. Some of our restaurants that are small and they go, well, we don't have the money for TV. We don't have the money to, to market. And, and we go, that's not the important thing about being a restaurateur. I, I think what we do really well, and, and I, my wife, Lynn, President of Rudy's does a fantastic job is community involvement. If you have one restaurant, if you have a hundred people go, you know, what, you know, if you're involved in a high school or a church or teams or whatever, really get involved in community and along with social media, which is the cost of it, is really creativity and using the right people to reach out there because if, I think you're going to have some professionals to help you, uh, you know, where to land certain Instagram and and all the different things as far as the search engines and things like that. But I think my, my point is community involvement is, is it's, it's expensive. It's a cost of food and product and service and volunteer. And I think that helps a lot for marketing. Let me, let me add to that. And, and he's exactly right. Um, you know, at the end of the day, your, your consumer, your guests, they want, they want a reason and purpose to go dine and spend their dollars. 
They say you, you create the world you want where you spend your money at. So um, you know, many of you, I'm sure, have heard the, 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 the term conscious capitalism. Well, we, are, we consider our, ourselves a, a conscious capitalist company. We, we get involved in a lot of uh, great causes, like the PTSD Foundation of America, helping our vets with PTSD. And uh, so, you, you, uh, uh, you know, conscious capitalism is basically elevating humanity through business. And that's what we try to do. And the more you give your guests and customers a reason to spend dollars with you, seeing how active and how you give back, the more successful you'll be at the end of the day. Can, can I say something? Yeah. Uh, in, in, it, for those of you in the restaurant industry, you know that there's an ask, 20 ask every day for something to, to, uh, to give to charity, to, to, to help with an event. And uh, we, we get probably over 3,000 ask a year. And uh, one of the things that we had to learn was is that when you do, you do want to give and you want to be a part of the community. And I think it's super, super important. And that's what we do. But, but the most important thing is who you engage with, that's a partnership, okay? That's not just a take. You know, what, what, what's, where, where, where are we gonna work together on this? And we had a group that we did something with for 19 years, closed the restaurant, fed 900 kids, and when where our ask was, one year we said, hey, we, we make sure every kid leaves with a gift at Christmas, come help us put the bikes together, put something on, on your website that you know county line is doing this for you and they wouldn't do it so we are not connected with them anymore so the main thing is is just have a list of asks when you are giving and, and make sure that they're promoting you in a way because you can't go promote yourself you can't you can't go promote yourself when you're doing something and donating so get their help to do that for you i think that's super important that's a great idea uh, we're running up against the clock but I want to thank everybody for being here, but I do, we'll stick around for a few minutes afterwards if we have a question we didn't get to, or if you have a question you didn't want to blurt out in front of everyone else. I um, really want to thank Creed and Russell and Skeeter for sitting with us today and talking about all these things. We could probably talk all day if we needed to, uh, so uh, be in touch. We're all, you can, we're all pretty easy to find. Russell? I want to take this opportunity to recognize someone in the audience. Uh, we have a James Beard winner a recipient here, Ugo Ortega, back in the back. Stand up, Ugo. One of the, runs three of the four, uh, finest restaurants in Houston. If you ever get out there, you have to try him. And his wife, Tracy, next to him. And uh, fantastic power team there, for sure. OK, well, if you're going to do that, <laughs> I want to recognize my team. And if they'll just stand up, this is, right, this is, probably, this is probably 400 years of experience right here. They can do it next to you. Okay. okay. If we're going to do that, I need to recognize my team over there. Stand up, gringos. All right. Uh, my team's working. <laughs> there is your priorities for you. I want to thank uh, Richard at the back who did our sound so you could hear us and everybody at TRA that's put this together. And thank you for being part of this. This is one of the most enjoyable things we get to do every year is get out and talk to each other, meet each other outside of our dining rooms. And uh, we'll be doing it uh, all day today, and we'll be seeing you in Houston next year.